It's episode 143 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Go to hankgarner.com where you can find the archives of all of the shows. Take a few minutes and dig through there. I bet you'll find something else that you really enjoy. Before we get into our interview this week, I'd like to tell you about a couple of sponsors. Pico's House. Crystal Pico Watanabe is one of the best editors in publishing today. She got her start as a beta reader for Hugh Howey and has been involved in some of the biggest projects in publishing. If you are an author and you need someone to help take your words and make them the very best they can be, Crystal Watanabe is who you need to call. If you let her know that you heard about this on Author Stories, when you book her services, you can get a 75% discount on manuscripts over 60,000 words in length or a $25 discount on short stories. Picoshouse.com, P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E.com. Let her know you heard about it on Author Stories. Also, Third Scribe, if you're an author and need a website or if you're a reader and want to connect with new books and authors... Third Scribe is the place to go. Rob and the crew over there are building something fascinating, something awesome that is bringing readers and writers together. Visit thirdscribe.com today and let them know you heard about it on Author Stories. Before we get into our uh, interview with Ann Rice today, uh, I've got a couple of spots to play for you from Chris Porto and from Richard Gleaves. Stay tuned. Legacy Fleet Avenger, The First Swarm War Book 2 by Chris Porto is now available on Amazon.com. From the best-selling world of Nick Webb's Legacy Fleet comes the follow-up to David Brun's Invincible, Legacy Fleet Avenger, available now on Amazon.com. Earth defeated the aliens once. Now they're back. After the devastating attack on Earth, the swarm fell back to regroup. Now, sooner than expected... They've returned to finish what they started, enslaving the human race. Samantha Avery, newly promoted captain of Avenger, has her hands full. A paid assassin seeking her death, a renegade officer working for the Swarm, and an enemy fleet bent on the destruction of the vital Wellington shipyards. As the Swarm launches a devastating attack against Britannia Sector, Avery finds she must seek victory on multiple fronts. But Avery is a patriot for humanity. She's a dam standing tall against the alien flood. She is an Avenger. Legacy Fleet Avenger is on sale now at Amazon.com. Now stay tuned for a short clip from Richard Glebe's Jason Crane series. How do we know when we are watched? Do the eyes of a predator reflect moonlight, focusing it on our skin? Do we feel two little spots of white on our neck and bristle with fear? I knew I was watched, and I could feel its quality. A man's gaze, like yearning eyes in a smoky tavern. I felt drawn to it. I skirted the pond, and beneath a vine-choked bower, I found the horseman's severed head. The braid at the back had snagged on some twig, turning the dead eyes upward. A dragonfly rode his cheek. It fled as I reached for him. I took hold of his braid, like the vine of a pumpkin, and drew him from the water. We sat together on a mossy log, he and I. Oh, I felt such joy to look upon his face again. I wiped the mud from his lips and nostrils, preparing him to be buried. The Domine could not watch the graveyard always, I decided. I would wait for night to fall, steal a shovel, and do the work myself. A trio of colonial soldiers were raising a redoubt nearby. Thomas the gravedigger brought them his own long-handled shovels. He stood and watched the soldiers work with professional interest, as dirt was his trade. Autumn leaves snagged in his hair, but he was too busy tale-telling to notice. The morning's dark business had quite bewitched his imagination. But the big one was a Hessian. One of them horsemen. Head lopped off by a cannonball. He'll be a-haunting this place now, he will. With a hip-hip and a clippity-clop. I'll be seeing headless spooks in my burying ground. Just you wait. And if he can't find his own head, he'll be wanting one of ours. Lord love us. He shivered, hands in pockets. The soldiers laughed at him. But the boy was serious. 
Our legend had begun to spin itself already, from the lips of our tow-headed gravedigger. Fact and fiction going their separate ways, severed as they often are. I listened with fascination. I had always loved a ghost story, and I'd never witnessed the birth of one before. Ghost stories are a form of history. If we say, three men died building that church and they forever haunt it, we keep those souls alive in death. Ghost stories are the past bleeding into the present, demanding acknowledgement of those unseen presences all around us, in our street names and genealogies and on our crumbling headstones. The tragedy of Old Willow, the fall of the horseman, the fate of you or I, these tales are forgotten by academic historians who chronicle only great men. But our small lives are remembered so long as our ghost stories are told. That is why we must tell them and retell them and keep them kindled in the hearts of our children. Thanks to all of our sponsors for sponsoring this week's show. Now on to our interview with Anne Rice. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today on the show with me is uh, is Anne Rice. I, I won't bury the lead. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited to have her on the show today. Uh, Miss Rice, thank you so much for taking time to come on the oh, show. I'm delighted to be with you, and please call me Anne. I I will. I'm I'm a I'm a Southern boy, so I was uh, I was taught to well, you, know, you know call everyone. Miss. I'm a Southern girl too, <laughs> and Mrs. Rice is my mother-in-law. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, well, I live just up the road from where you're from. So, uh, in, uh, in, in Mississippi. So I, I, I think we have a, uh, a bit of a kindred spirit. Oh, absolutely. But. Absolutely. And I have many Mississippi cousins and, uh, I'm in touch with them all the time and they're wonderful. Of course. Of course. Um, and, uh, I'm, it's going to take me a minute to get used to calling you Anne, but uh, Anne, uh, I begin each show uh, with a variation of the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? You know, I've, I've actually answered that many times, and I remember at five years of age trying to write a novel. I was sitting in my house in New Orleans and asking my grandmother and my mother how to spell every word, and I recall writing the sentence, uh, I must have been six years old because I knew how to do the alphabet, you know, so I I wrote the sentence, Lily is sitting in her chambers, and I remember I thought that was very exciting and very dramatic (laughs) and very romantic, and I I remember it very well, wanting to write the whole story, but I don't think I ever got past the first line due to the obvious fact that I really didn't know how to spell yet or, or actually write. But I've always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to make stories. And it wasn't too long before I actually wrote what I considered a novel in the fifth grade. I must have, but were you in the fifth grade? We're 10 years old, I think. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I hear that uh, uh, an answer similar to that so many times that, uh, that st- I, I honestly believe uh, that storytellers are born uh, and that writers are made. We We take that that uh, innate storytelling gene that's in us, and then we we work at that, and we become writers and authors. And uh, but I think there's something that we're born with that we just want to uh, we want to tell stories. We want to make up these imaginary places and people, and and see what they'll do. I think you're right. I really do. Uh, at the same time, I don't think anybody else can ever tell you that you're not a writer. You know, nobody else can come along and say, "Well, I don't think you have the gene." You know, the, the, the fact is uh, we don't know what that gene really is. We don't know how it works. But I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's something there that comes naturally to us that has to do with, uh, how would you say it, working out problems in narrative. We don't consciously think of it that way, but that's what we do. We make up a dream story. We make up a drama. I was a daydreamer early on a daydreamer. I was always walking around in a daydream on my way home from school, pretending to be this or that character involved in an action-packed story. There's never a dull moment in my brain, never, you know? And and that has to be almost like, that's like a chemical in the brain. It's It's like you said, it's a gene. We have something there that we inherited. And people who don't have it often don't really know what we're talking about when we talk about it. 
right. I, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you get looked at as the, uh, as the, the weird cousin at the family reunion or, or something, yeah. you know, we just, uh, we leave them sitting over there to, to talk with the voices in their well, head. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I know my oldest sister, who was probably the single most potent influence on my whole life, my oldest sister Alice and I, as little girls, were always in a dream world. We would pretend to be two characters, Mary and Medine, who were traveling the world with thousands of their children. We had just uh, thousands of kids. And everywhere we went, we built castles. And every child would take one brick and lay it into place, and voila, there would be the castle within five minutes, and we'd have a new house. And we we just lived the lives of Mary and Medine. And both of us grew up to be novelists. Alice is gone now. She died a few years ago, and she left behind six novels and was very successful. Alice Borchard is her full name, and she wrote Arthurian romance and werewolf novels. And she loved just out-and-out storytelling. And that was something we loved when we were just tiny kids. That's that's so cool. I I, uh, I another recurring theme is that uh, that there's uh, almost always a person of influence uh, that uh, that sees that little spark in someone else and, and stokes that into a, a fire. Sometimes it's a parent. Sometimes it's a teacher. Sometimes it's an older sister. Um, that's amazing. I love that. Well, my father was a writer when I was growing up. He was the first real writer I ever met, and he was writing a novel for children called The Impulsive Imp. And he would read his chapters of The Impulsive Imp. And I think that had a powerful influence on both Alice and me. That novel, by the way, is published. It's out there under, his name was Howard O'Brien, and one of my sisters has uh, published it independently. But it was a wonderful novel, and it was more wonderful than that was the example he was giving us of somebody that was a writer who believed in writing. Because too often when you talk about wanting to be a writer, somebody tells you, oh, what makes you think you can be a writer? What makes you think you can publish books? Who are you? You know, and and it's wonderful. Right. We just had the example right there of our dad typing up those chapters, working on them, asking us what we liked, what we didn't like, and going and working with that feedback and then coming back the next evening or several evenings later and reading us another chapter. It was wonderful. It really uh, was. What a wonder, What a wonderful example. Um, I... Uh, I recently recently interviewed Brandon Sanderson, and he told me a story that uh, was very impactful to me. Um, he he told the story of writing thirteen novels before ever getting published, and having to come to the realization in himself uh, that he was going to tell these stories whether they ever got published or not. That was just part of who he was. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I I think and, and and he went on to say that that we put this weird. I, I don't know. He, he was saying the other hobbies that people have, uh, they don't put the requirement on that to, to ever go professional. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as soon as you say you're going to write a novel, you know, people start putting these weird requirements mm-hmm. and things like that on it. And um, mm-hmm. I think you had a uh, an interesting story uh, with the, the – it took a while for you to get your first novel uh, published, didn't it? Well, it took a lot longer than I ever dreamed it would. You know, if somebody had told me in my 20s, um, you're not going to – you know, you're not going to be published in your 20s. You're going to be 35 before you see a novel in print. I would have been very discouraged. But that is, in fact, what happened. And But I'll tell you, the night I finished uh, Interview with the Vampire, which did turn out to be my first novel, I knew that I had pulled something together, and I knew that it had been a breakthrough for me. And I rem- the reason I remember is I, I keep a diary, a handwritten diary, and I wrote in my diary that night, this will be my first published novel, even if I have to sell it myself out of a shopping bag on Fifth Avenue. Print it up and sell it myself. And, and I'll tell you, I was inspired to do that by a poet that lived in Berkeley at that time. Her name was Julia Vinograd, and she used to go around on Telegraph Avenue selling her books of poetry out of a bag. She'd come up to you in a cafe and say, you want to buy a book of poetry? And I always thought that was a courageous thing for that woman to do. I I bought her book over and over again, you know, (laughs) (laughs) to support her. But I really thought, I I, I, I thought of Julia Vinograd, and I thought, I'm going to do that, you know, with this novel, because I know I did something here that I haven't been able to do before, and I have a sense of completeness, of resolution. But uh, fortunately for me, within nine months, that novel was accepted for publication, and it did go on to become Interview with the Vampire, published in 1976 when I was 35. But uh, I, I hope and pray that I would have gone on 
even if it had taken another 10 years, you know, or another right. 15 years, I would have gone on. Um, I love that story about the, the poet in Berkeley. Like she was, uh, she was forming her own indie author revolution long before the Kindle was ever invented. That's, she, uh, she, <laughs> that's great. She was. And you know, I have no idea whatever happened to Julia Vinograd. I mean, I haven't seen her since those days in Berkeley when I would be in cafes and she would come walking in with her bag, but she certainly influenced me. I mean, it, it, it was a wonderful thing. And of course, now we're used to the indie writer revolution. We have many people yeah. indie publishing, but back Back then, you know, indie publishing wasn't wasn't considered respectable. People just assumed if, if you weren't good enough to be published by a legitimate company if you were, in fact, publishing something yourself. So when I wrote that, I, I guess I meant I'm willing to take the slings and arrows, you know, uh, for this right. novel. But fortunately, I didn't have to do that. Vicki Wilson and Alfred A. Knopf accepted the novel and... Uh, I, it began my career as a published writer, and now I think what a, it's forty years later, this year, uh, that you know, interview with the vampire was published. Forty years, and I have a new novel with Lestat coming out in a matter of three weeks. So, uh, so awesome. Uh, what was it? Uh, you said when you finished that book, you you just knew that there was something about this, and uh, and and you've gone on to. Uh, you know, people have said that you really defined a genre with that book. Uh, where did the the interesting idea and the twist on the genre come from for you? And uh, and where did Lestat come from? It was all so organic, so spontaneous, so much a matter of feeling and instinct that I honestly can't say. It was like I had been writing up to that time at realistic stories, pedestrian realism. You know, the, what was popular at the time as serious literature was pedestrian right. realism. The very highest forms were written by Philip Roth and Saul Bellow and, and John Updike, and it was highly respected. And I was trying to write that, and I, I just didn't break through. And on a whim, I thought, what if I write a story about someone interviewing a vampire? Um, a, a, an FM radio guy interviewing a vampire. Well, and the vampire tells everything. And I wrote that story, put it away, took it out, rewrote it a couple of times, and then the last time it started to grow into that novel, Interview with the Vampire. And it was an accident. It was like I had stepped through a magic door uh, into my world. Like, like when I was writing from the point of view of that fantastic preternatural being in his black cape with his fangs, I was suddenly able to write about what was real to me, what was exciting, what, what I felt passionately about. And this whole 19th century story opened up with plantation houses and the colorful Spanish uh, architecture of New Orleans and two vampires in the 19th century roaming those streets, drinking blood from victims, seeking to find the meaning of life. It all just took fire. And I left behind all those bad pedestrian realistic efforts of mine <laughs> that had never worked, that had never had this kind of magic. And I stepped into a world of metaphor, I suppose, where I was really able to pour my heart out. But I didn't plan it. I had no idea. Lestat was the villain in the novel. I really didn't even pay much attention to Lestat. I mean, Louis was the hero. He was the good vampire. And Lestat was the bad guy. And Lestat just sort of blazed into color, like in the corner of my eye. And when I decided to write the sequel, um, it was Lestat, really, that, that drew me and really became the foundation of the Vampire Chronicles as a series. In uh, in 1976, when that book was published, uh, in, in the mid 70s, there you said that uh, pedestrian realism was was really the, uh, the the thing to be publishing at the time. Yeah. Uh, did what was what was the reaction uh, that you got from people when you came up with this uh, this you know uh, this horror period piece? Um, well, I was rejected you know, by a number of people. Um, one person said she just didn't know what it was. It was a New York agent. She said, <laughs> this doesn't seem to be black comedy, and it doesn't seem to be tongue-in-cheek, and I don't know what it is. So what, what she was, in, in essence, saying really was, what is she to make of a, of a novel about a 19th century vampire looking for the meaning of life? You know, she just never seen anything <laughs> like it. So, so right. she rejected it. And a number of people did with pretty much that same kind of reaction. It just wasn't for them. I remember the famous editor, Michael Corda. 
he rejected it with the line, alas, I can't see this at all. You know, that's all he said. You know? <laughs> like, so I, I think it was, I think it was genre busting or it was uh, original to the point of being unclassifiable. It, it just, at that time, serious literature really was pedestrian realism. It wasn't like it is today. You didn't, you didn't have bookstores uh, with so much fantasy and thrillers and detective novels and vampire novels. and you, you, genre, genre hadn't broken into the mainstream. Genre was on the back shelves in the bookstore. That's where you went to read horror, fantasy, sci-fi, you know, Arthurian romance. You went back there. Those, those genres were flourishing, but they had not broken into the mainstream. And so it, it had a hard time. I mean, it was published by a major house, and it was published as a serious novel, and there was a lot, a lot of rejection. It flopped in hardcover, really. But when it did find its audience uh, and it really got its legs, uh, what was that feeling like for you? To uh, did, did you feel vindicated? Did you feel like uh, okay, I, I I really was onto something? I, I I I did. I felt vindicated, and it was a long haul. I I broke off. It, 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 as I said, the novel flopped in hardcover. It it succeeded in paperback because the paperback rights had been purchased to it before it was published and so the paperback house had a big commitment to it and they they made it a bestseller in paperback so and, and after that it became kind of an underground bestseller it was on the back shelves in the horror section and it hung on back there and by the time i wrote the sequel the vampire lestat it had accumulated a very large readership and the vampire lestat became my first hardcover bestseller and that was a great moment. I'll never forget that, you know, when it went on the list at number eight, I think. But, I mean, that was, to me, a fabulous breakthrough. And we were all excited, and the publisher was excited. It was it was a great moment for me. And, yeah, I did feel, I felt, I don't know how to say vindicated. I felt lucky. I felt grateful. I felt happy. I felt emboldened to continue, um, you know, to do what I wanted to do. Um, I was a very ambitious person. I loved writing, and I really wanted to be read. I wanted people to care about what I wrote. So, yeah, it was a great moment, no question. I had written some other novels in between. Um, I had written um, an historical novel called Feast of All Saints and another one called Cry to Heaven, which was about the 18th century Castrati opera world. And those novels had been modest successes. But I didn't get the intensity in those works that I got when I wrote about my beloved Lestat and Louis and about my vampires. Some, as I said, everything just comes into focus when I'm writing about them. It catches fire. And I felt very happy to, that that is what had broken through for me, that world. I, I can only imagine uh, the feeling that you had when, uh, when The Vampire Lestat uh, became that hardcover bestseller and knowing uh, that it was largely due to uh, word of mouth and that you had really created this underground fan base like you talked about. So it really was the... Uh, uh, was the power of your your fans that made uh, that book a success? I, I can only that imagine the, the feeling. That was true. It was yeah, not even the, a large printing by the house. You know what I mean? It wasn't. It, it with the next book, uh, there was even a greater ratification. Queen of the Dam became the first number one bestseller. You know, it went to the actual top of the New York Times list. But that time, it had the support of the house. The editor-in-chief, yeah, right. Vicki Wilson and, and Sonny Mehta, had seen that there was a potential for the book to break through, and they had printed enough and sent enough. But, I mean, that alone wouldn't have done it. I don't mean to make it sound like it would have, because many times the market's flooded with boxes of a book, and it does not go over. People right, have to right. buy it. They have to want it. But if you don't get that support, if you don't get that printing out there, uh, you don't have a chance for that kind of fire to catch on. But with The Vampire Lestat, the, the, the second one, there hadn't even been that big printing. It just caught fire. It was word of mouth. And it did become a bestseller. And I was, I was just over the moon with gratitude. I mean, I wish every writer could know that feeling. You know, it was such a great feeling. And, and, and if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. It can ha I mean, to anybody. I'm talking to the world of writers now when I say you. You know, it, believe me, I, I did it in a back room in, in manage to take care of a baby and cook for a family and still do it and, and you can do it too you know it can happen you can do it 
Sure. Um, another thing that fascinates me is the way uh, that writers use place uh, as a almost like a character and where the, the setting uh, is so ingrained in the story. And uh, you obviously are from New Orleans and uh, and that uh, that kind of bleeds through into your work. Um, how do you do you feel that and and do you approach that in any any particular way about bringing the the new orleansness uh into your story you know i i i know exactly what you're talking about new orleans really is a character in my work it's influenced yeah. my work incredibly i mean i grew up in this most wonderful intoxicatingly beautiful city uh absolutely unique city and and from very early childhood i was truly, truly in love with the the architecture of New Orleans and the giant oak trees of New Orleans and the purple evening skies and, and the beauty of my environment. I didn't understand why everybody else wasn't standing there staggered on the corner at sunset saying, look at that violet-colored sky. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at look at these oak trees, how beautiful they are when they move just a little bit in the breeze like this. I never did understand why other people weren't, like, walking around in the French Quarter and just gaping at the buildings and saying how beautiful. And and it, it was very much my desire to, like, sustain a world of beauty like that in my writing that motivated me to write. It was a way to enter into and prolong the moment, you know, of standing on a corner and right. looking at a beautiful tree or looking at a gorgeous old, um, you know, Greek Revival mansion uh, with with Greek columns on the front and and, and I, I just I don't know it was that was certainly part of it for me and I think in a way I'm probably writing about New Orleans all the time no matter what I'm describing I'm, I'm <laughs> you know what I mean it's it's like whatever was, I, I know exactly what you and mean and also the Catholic Church played a huge role I I went to 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 mass every day in in these giant beautiful churches of New Orleans that had been built by the immigrant Irish and Germans before us and. Those churches are, are still magnificent places, filled with stained glass and murals and gorgeous statuary, all of which came from Europe. Um, you know, European painters came, I believe, to paint those murals, and and uh, well, I know the statues came from Europe, and stained glass did. And I used to sit in those pews at, at mass, and and you know, I couldn't help but be distracted by all that beauty. And just, it was a world, it was an ambiance, it was an atmosphere. And it was very much New Orleans. It was a very much Southern kind of Catholicism, very Latin, very old-fashioned, very Mediterranean. And all of that influenced right. me, too, as a writer. Very, very much the reality of spiritual questions was was paramount in that kind of religious upbringing. It was far more important than whatever was material in this world. Well, and the uh, it, I, I love what you said about the the church uh, and and being part of the culture there because uh, in the South uh, our uh, religion and I'm using that in, in air quotes uh, is definitely a part of our culture uh, and the farther south in the South you go uh, the more Catholic that is mm -hmm. uh, and um, that um, it, it is a very big part of of kind of who we mm -hmm. are and it influences uh the, the way people behave and and the the language we use and all all sorts of things uh but you wrote a couple of books uh based on the life of christ uh, christ the lord mm -hmm. out of egypt and uh, the road to cana mm -hmm. um you you did choose to um uh to write these fictionalized accounts of christ uh, but I would I would love to hear you talk about the the difference in those books, uh, and maybe some of the metaphor that you use in your other books uh, that do uh, kind of look into the spiritual side of life and and how that there the the uh, kind of that there is more that's unseen. Well, you know the the two books I wrote on Christ I think are very different from anything else that I ever wrote. Um, they were really, really deeply spiritual and religious exercises. I wanted very much to make real for the reader um, the person of Jesus Christ as I understood him from the Bible and from history. And as a consequence, I, I went back to the first century, did a tremendous amount of research, tremendous amount of research on the Bible itself, biblical criticism, um, the architecture, the, the government, the social milieu of the first century, all of that 
and then tried to create the character of Jesus Christ growing up in a Jewish family in in that period, the Second, second Temple Judaism. And I had to leave behind all my ornate language and my love of language and my love of ornate environments and the Baroque and the Rococo because I was describing somebody growing up in a village in in first century Palestine, and I was describing a a life that was quite minimalist, really, and not terribly sensuous, except in a very natural way, what it meant to sit down and feast, you know, to eat the Passover lamb and so forth with the family. But I, I had to cut my language down to what I thought would create a really accurate illusion of the way Jesus might have talked with the members of his family. And so it was quite a discipline to write those books quite a discipline and the governing principle was to make that jesus real absolutely real to the reader whether that reader was a christian or an atheist or an agnostic or an anti-christian to to just say look let's assume he's real and let's assume every word of the bible is accurate and this is who he is and let's say okay what was life like for him at six years old what was it like for him to be going home with the family from egypt at the time that Herod was was dead and Herod Archelaus was trying to gain control of Jerusalem and he had so much trouble coming from the rebels and the whole land was in turmoil and the Romans were about to step in. I mean, you know, what was that like? What was it like for that little boy? Well, how did the family treat him? I mean, angels had sung at his birth. You know, they had been told that this was this was a child sent from God for a special purpose. But what was it like if he didn't know that yet and he had to learn how to use carpenter's tools and speak and talk just like anybody else which i believe he did and that was the whole thrust of those novels and so um i'm very very humbly proud of them to this day but um i recognize how unusual they were and for many of my readers they didn't go over you know they just they just said this is not what i want from you i want your old language i want the lushness i want the baroque i want the sensuality and I respected that, and I understand that. But, again, I'm proud of those two books. I'm very, especially the second one, Christ the Lord, The Road to Cana, because in that book I tried to present Jesus on the eve of his public life after years of waiting for a sign as to what he's supposed to do. And I tried to present how difficult life, I think, must have been for him in the village, a man who was refusing to marry, even though that was expected of him, absolutely expected, and who was waiting for what he knew would come with the with really the appearance of John the Baptist, the moment for him to step out and to go into public life. And I, I, I will always love that novel, I think, more than any novel I ever wrote. It just just it's just a per, what would you say, a personal best. It was just something I was able to pull off for myself and even though it did well, it was a bestseller, um, but it didn't do anything as well as some of my other books have done, I'm still personally just holding it to my heart. Yeah, and and that's a that's a really um, important point. Uh, I think you are one of the best selling authors of all time, uh, and yet you still wrote a book that you believed very deeply in. It's very personal to you. Uh, it's an outstanding book. Was very well received uh, by a particular audience, uh, but your maybe core audience didn't. They didn't understand it. It mm-hmm. just didn't resonate with yeah. them. Uh, yet you did it anyway yeah. because that was the that was the thing in you that you needed to do. Um, how important is it for artists uh, to to follow their passion and to and uh, pardon the pun, uh, but to to follow their passion and to do uh, the thing that is resonating deeply with them even if maybe some people won't understand it. I think it's terribly important that you write absolutely what you want to write, that you be true to that passion, that you do not let yourself be intimidated out of it by any any force. Um, I think it's terribly important. But I also understand the disappointment that any writer feels when the audience says, this isn't what we want from you. It's a hard thing to negotiate with yourself in your heart. Um, it really is. It's difficult. And uh, that was a painful experience, too. But I've had that with other books as well. You know, I've, I've written other books that were just absolutely smashingly wonderful, and my readers didn't necessarily think that way. Um, so I, it, I've had that experience um, more than once, but you, can't, you just keep going. You just keep doing your best. I mean, what your readers are really asking you to do is your best. They're asking you to give it all to them. 
And they may not like this or that about the book, and they may step back, but that's what they really still want. They want you to risk everything and give them your best. The ones who tell you exactly what they want, I think maybe they're – they don't know exactly how to get what they want. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I can see that. I can see that. Um, your newest book, uh, which releases around the time that this interview is going to release, uh, is called Prince Lestat and the Realms of Atlantis, or Prince Lestat. Uh, tell me about this book, and, and uh, when did uh, Lestat – uh, surface again for you and, and tell you that he wanted to have a new book out? Well, it was several years ago now that I published the book Prince Lestat. That, you know, I think that was 2013, wasn't it? I'm, I'm not even, I'm not good at numbers, but I think it was three years ago. <laughs> but he, he, Lestat came back. I mean, I didn't think I would ever write about him again. I, I associated my vampires with depression and despair and pain, and they had always been for me the most beautiful way that I personally could express that pain. But I had gone into uh, a different phase of life, and I, did, I thought I had done everything I could do with them. But about eight years passed, and I really wanted to get back in with Lestat. I, I, new stories came to me. That's the simplest way to put it, new stories and new ideas. And I started thinking, well, what's it like for the Vampire Tribe now? What is it like for them with the Internet and 24-7 uh, surveillance all over the world? How are they surviving all this? Are they able to find each other with the Internet in ways that they couldn't before? And that, that kind of gave rise to the novel Prince Lestat, where the tribe comes together, uh, principally because of the Internet and an Internet radio show, and calls on the elders of the tribe to come out and be real parents to the young vampires. And Lestat, Lestat hears the call and the pressure from all sides to be the leader and finally acknowledges that and does become the prince of the tribe. And this new novel, um, Prince Lestat in the Realms of Atlantis, it really flows right out of that earlier Prince Lestat novel. It's about, um, of course, it's about the, the lost kingdom of Atlantis, the legend of Atlantis, and how it intimately ties in with the vampires themselves. I love it. I love it. Um, so uh, research for this book, uh, what was that like? W were you looking at uh, legends and, uh, and, and different uh, things that have been uncovered or different uh, you know, myths and, and theories about Atlantis? Oh, yeah. I had been researching it for a long time. I was trying to write a novel called Born for Atlantis, and um, it would, I just couldn't get it to work. And I had created a number of characters and had a whole vision of what Atlantis had been like and what it had been like to live there. You know, I think, I think one of the most delicious things in the world is to do your own version of Atlantis. You know, if you ever look yeah. at all the different novels that people have done and the different movies, it's just such a delicious, tempting thing. And I, would, I wanted to do that. But I couldn't make the overall thing really work. And then when I thought of bringing it in contact with Lestat and the vampires, again, everything caught fire. Everything caught fire. It was just, you know, when I added Lestat to the mix and thought, what if, what if, and what if, um, it all it all ignited, and everything I had written almost in Born for Atlantis in those chapters and and segments, all of that went into this book. That's great, and Atlantis is one of those things that we we know just enough, uh, or we we have just enough little pieces here and there uh, to just really tantalize and to uh, really stoke the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, I can only imagine when you when you introduce Lestat there how that uh, just took shape. I can't wait to read oh, well, it. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> to hear that. I I, I was tempted by all the all the legends and and I've been tem and also the the recent all the recent uh Atlantis literature that has to do with channeling and and people apparently talking under hypnosis because they are reincarnated beings from Atlantis. Edgar Casey wrote a lot about it, or revealed a lot in his trances about the ancient kingdom of Atlantis. Ruth Montgomery is another New Age writer who claims to have channeled a lot of material about Atlantis. And of course, all these people, they disagree with each other on what it was like. And it's kind of <laughs> thrilling. And again, I thought, well, let me get in there and try to do this. I always feel like I'm channeling anyway when I'm writing. So let me see what I can come up with. Another author who influenced me a great deal was Graham Hancock. Uh, he he wrote a wonderful yeah. book called Underworld, or, and it was all about um, you know the theory that there had been a great shift in in the water level of the oceans, the uh, sea level, 
11, 12,000 years ago, and at that time, maybe a giant civilization was lost. Flood in, they wiped off the, the map, basically, all the coastal cities of this culture, and that if we go back in our legends and we, and we go actively exploring, we can even find the ruins. And he did a lot of diving for that book when he was writing it. He went to coastal ruins and, and went down and actually looked at them underwater. And I, I found him just, now that's all nonfiction, what, what Graham Hancock wrote, but I found it tremendously inspiring. Uh, I, I've read uh, a couple of his books and uh, and his uh, his research into ancient lost civilizations is yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and if if you're a writer, if you're a fiction writer, uh, you need to read his stuff. It, even if if for nothing else, just to stoke the imagination. Oh, that's it. That's it. See, there's always part of me that's reading Graham Hancock's books and other books like those, uh, as 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 one to know the facts. But there's another ruthless writer part of me that's being inspired and just you know immediately <laughs> dreaming and seeing my own kingdom of Atlantis and my own possibilities. And I've always read mythology and history and archaeology in that way. Always. I, I mean, I love them. I find them very inspiring. You know. Yeah. Um. You have always been very generous with your time uh, toward uh, new writers uh, and with your readers, um, and you have a very prominent social media presence uh, on Facebook, especially with your people of the page, uh, and uh, and you really cultivate a community there. Uh, how has that changed for you? In in the 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 last uh, few years, well, with the the advent of not only the internet but social media, uh, we really have this interesting thing where we can get very close to our readers uh, and uh, and and form new interesting relationships. Uh, how, how has that evolved for you over time? It's been great. It's been absolutely great. Uh, it was my publisher that first suggested we set up a Facebook page. And I had no idea how much fun it was going to be. But I went on it from the very beginning myself and posted and talked to the readers. And from the beginning, it was great. I mean, I, I found out I could prompt discussion on any topic and get uh, hundreds of responses right away and a really good discussion going. I could ask a simple question uh, and get all kinds of answers. I find it invaluable, and I find it tremendous fun. The only real glitch with it came for me um, – in 2016 with politics, there, it, it, I found that it was not really the best place any longer to discuss presidential politics because things just got too heated. And, and I backed off of that topic. But with every other topic I've ever discussed, uh, it's been tremendous, and particularly in ask, just asking questions. Like I could go on there this afternoon and just ask the people to the page, um, what do you think about what Lestat says about um, about religion? Do you think he's right when he says those things, or do you find that offensive? And I'll get 100, 200, 300 answers right away. I mean, it's just great. I, I'm surprised that other that not all writers really love it and see. And I'll tell you something else. I suggested once in a high powered phone call with movie moguls that if there's anything they wanted me to ask on my Facebook page, I'd be glad to ask the readers. Uh, about Lestat and the Vampire Chronicles and movies, and they absolutely snickered like that was so stupid. And I thought to myself what? when I got off the phone, I thought, that's really sad that you don't see the resource you have here to actually ask the public what the public thinks. You know, I mean, here I was talking to these moguls, you know, who control what's right. going to be the next movie. And I thought, and they just oh, sneered at mercy. the idea. They acted like I was a little fool. But, you know, it didn't deter me in the slightest. I mean, I will at any point ask them any question about what they value, what kind of books they like, what kind of stories they like, what they want of writers, what you just asked me. Do people want you to, you know, to vote your passion with every word? And I, the people of the page never let me down. They give me tremendous only on politics that was the one area but that wasn't their fault i mean it's just the fault of the times and the fault of politics oh that, like like they have no idea that those people are the ones that buy yeah. the books and buy the yeah, movie tickets exactly here <laughs> i was saying well why don't you let me ask the people of the page i have a million and a half of them <laughs> you know, oh, let me ask him a question goodness. or two about what they want to see Lestat do in this movie. Oh, they were just, they just acted like, you poor little idiot. <laughs> I just, oh, they didn't mercy. say that. It was just a sticker that came through the phone, you know. But but I, I go right on doing it. I, I don't pay any attention. I mean, um, it, I do think 
I do think movies today are more sensitive to the fans than they have ever been. They have learned the hard way that if you don't respect yeah. the fans, you're going to have hell to pay. And and I think they're still processing that, you know, the incredible success of The Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. You know, this is really the age of the Comic-Con nerd, and that's been a hard right. pill for Hollywood to swallow because it wants to control everything, <laughs> you know, and it can't. And, and the fan, the nerd rules today, and I think that's wonderful. Well, and the, the, the Comic-Con nerd uh, really... Uh, held the door open for for all genre mm-hmm. uh, f- fiction and uh, and adaptations and things like that. So mm-hmm. uh, we should all be very very thankful for that. Um, speaking of that, are we going to see Lestat and uh, and crew on the big screen I, I anytime soon? I hope so. I hope so. We were able to sell the entire Vampire Chronicles to Universal Studios. And that was a year and a half ago, roughly. And there is a script in the works. I mean, I don't have the power to disseminate information. You know, it has to come from the studio. But you can read in the news articles, it's Josh Boone who's writing the script. Josh Boone is the director who became super famous for The Fault in Their Stars, um, a wonderful movie based on the John Green novel. And Josh is writing the script, and the, the whole thing is in the works. And... Um, there hasn't been any official word yet of anything, but I, I, I think it's a really good team, and these are good people, and uh, I think something really good is going to happen. Is Josh Boone also uh, the one who's been uh, uh, associated with the new remake of The Stand? Yes, that's the same Josh Steve? Boone, yeah. I, Okay, yeah, I, I heard an interview with him, and the way he talked about The Stand, uh, you just knew he was a fan and that he was going to do – the best service to this project that could ever be done. So I, I have very high hopes that he will do the same yeah. uh, with yeah, yours. That's, that's what I hope. I really do. Yeah, that's really great. Um, and thank you so much for taking time uh, out of your very busy schedule to come on the show. Uh, I'm going to put links to your website and the Facebook page uh, in the uh, in the show notes. Is there anything that you would like to impart uh, to our audience of, of writers and readers, uh, a little uh, nugget of wisdom that you've gathered over the last 40 years of publishing that you'd like to leave? Oh, well, thank you. I, I guess my message is always the same to all the writers out there. Absolutely believe in yourself, believe in your vision, believe in your eccentricities, believe in your passions, and don't ever ever let anybody stop you from realizing your dream. If you run into criticism, if you run into a brick wall, just turn around and go someplace else and just keep believing in yourself. A lot of people tell me to quit. A lot of people tell me I was crazy. A lot of people tell me I had no talent and no natural ability. I never paid attention. And so my message is always the same. Believe in yourself and believe in your visions, and one day you'll be standing in a, in a bookstore with a line in front of you, and you'll be signing autographs, and those people who put you down and sneered at you will be coming up and wanting you to sign books for their families, and they won't even remember when they told you you didn't have any talent. That's really, really great advice. Uh, the new book is called Prince Lestat and the Realms of Atlantis, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure we're all going to run out and get a copy of that. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Thank man. you. I've enjoyed it very, very much. Thank you. You've been listening to the Author Stories Podcast with Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. When you're there, please subscribe to the show and leave a comment over on iTunes or Google Play. You can even subscribe at YouTube and Stitcher Radio. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy what I do, uh, podcasting or my writing, please uh, check out my Patreon campaign. There's a link at hankgarner.com. Be sure to tune in every Tuesday and Friday for brand new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast. Thanks for listening.